I would like to welcome Dr. Andy Welton. Uh, Andrew Welton is an assistant professor of civil engineering and environmental and ecological engineering here at Purdue University. Prior to joining Purdue University, he served on the University of South Alabama faculty and worked for the US Army, NIST, Virginia Tech, and several engineering consulting firms. Upon Governor Earl Ray Tomlin's request, Welton assisted the state of West Virginia investigating the 2014 Elk River chemical spill. The spill prompted a drinking water ban for more than 15% of the state's population that lasted more than a week. Uh, Dr. Welton has testified at the Indiana Senate, briefed the US Chemical Safety Board, and delivered invited seminars, workshops, and lectures across the US. Two of his current research emphases are to develop uh, approaches for better predicting drinking water quality at the tap and safely decontaminating premise plumbing. Today he will present a talk titled, Why is our plumbing harming us? Uh, so if you would uh, go ahead and silence your cell phones and other devices. Uh, but this is Dawn or Doom, so do not turn them off. We would like to see you tweeting. You can use the hashtag Dawn or Doom. Uh, and if you would like to um, post your pictures and comments on your favorite social media sites, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, what have you, uh, let's get the word out. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Andy Welton. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to, today's Wednesday, right? I always ask this in my class. What day is today? Tuesday. Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. All right. So uh, welcome to Tuesday afternoon at 3.30. This is fantastic. I, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much to, to Purdue for the invitation to speak and for all the staff members who, who've, who've done something to help this make possible. I'm going to talk to you about plumbing and drinking water safety. And I'm going to do that because it's personal. Okay, so plumbing and drinking water safety is personal because at some point we have to make decisions about whether or not we take a sip of something or we don't. We always want to know, is it going to harm us? <clears throat> so plumbing is the pipes, the tanks, the valves, the fittings, anything that basically conveys water from one place inside a building. Okay, and plumbing has been around since three to 4,000 BC. So they've been using copper pipe in India since three to 4,000 BC. Plumbing's not a new thing, okay? They've been using lead pipes at about 500 uh, AD, okay? So the presence of lead has been around a long time. Copper's been around a long time. For those of you who are thinking using rainwater for drinking purposes is new, novel, never been done, you're a couple thousand years late uh, because somebody has already done this before, but what we don't understand really is how it could harm us. In 1928, the first uh, plumbing code was, was passed in the U.S. called the Hoover Code because Herbert Hoover uh, helped get it passed, uh, as well as uh, 1966 copper shortages happened. And when that happens, everybody looks for another material that's less expensive, and they started infusing plastics into everything. Okay? <clears throat> so this is a typical diagram of a two-story residential house. Okay? And this diagram goes for, for mobile homes, for vacation homes, Really, uh, really any type of home. So what I want to do is to bring you through the process of where your water goes. So it typically comes in here. It comes in through this piping <clears throat> before it enters your house, and that's typically called the service line. And the service line takes the water into the house, uh, and it can be made of a number of different materials. If it's not coming from the city, your water is coming from a well or from some other source. Next, what happens is the water goes through, if you decide to have one, a whole house filter. And a whole house filter is used to basically treat the water as it comes into your house. So maybe you want to remove um, some chlorine, maybe you want to remove some particles that are coming in, you'll have a whole house filter. In Indiana, and I never had one of these before until I came to Indiana, you have softeners. And softeners are everywhere. And if you don't have a softener, and I can tell you this firsthand, uh, your appliances will all break very quickly, and it costs a lot of money to fix them. Uh, and then when you wash your dishes, they don't get clean. And so uh, in Indiana, where we have a lot of hard groundwater and use that for drinking purposes, you have to have a softener. We all have water heaters. Water heaters are tanks that basically heat up water. These have been around since the 1800s, uh, and they kind of have the same technology as they do today as they did in the 1800s. 
there are tanks that basically uh, the water comes into the tank, it has a heating coil, it heats up the water, and then the water leaves the tank. One of the issues with water heaters, however, is that you have solids that build up on the bottom because water heaters are basically sedimentation basins. They are pools, and if we throw dirt on one side of the pool, it's probably not going to make it to the other side because it's all going to settle out. Okay? So water heaters have sediment. We also have hot and cold water pipes. We have plastics. We have metals. We have all sorts of different pipes. We have fittings. We have all these different types of materials. And <clears throat> if you ever go to a local uh, home supply store, you'll see a wall of faucets and a wall of shower heads. And you, know, you can pick whichever one you like. They all look different. Uh, some of the insides, though, are pretty much the same. There's a lot of plastics. There's a lot of metal. Uh, and there's just a lot of surface area associated with these materials. And then what we have is uh, point of use devices, right? So in Flint, Michigan right now, everybody should be using a point of use device because the water that's being distributed to them is not safe and contains lead, okay? This is, when they talk about point of use devices, this is exactly the type of devices that they're installing in, in Flint, Michigan. People use these at their homes. Uh, I've used them at my home uh, when we had very high chlorine levels because we wanted to strip out the chlorine. Corrosion products, if we want to go in and autopsy the plumbing system, we'll go in and we'll cut open the pipes and we'll see what's there. And this image was sent to me by somebody in West Virginia whose uh, home basically got replumbed after a chemical spill. <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a very, very, very small hole. That's because of how much the pipe corroded, okay? So when you have corrosion, you have uh, restricted flow and, and you have uh, less water delivered to your tap. And with corrosion, comes habitat. <clears throat> and I talk about habitat as a place for things to grow. Okay, so when you have a lot of surface area uh, organisms, microorganisms or bacteria, like to set up home. And they grow into these things called biofilms. And within those biofilms can lurk dangerous creatures that we need to worry about. So this is a technology conference and want to make you aware of uh, a, a new technology. In the last uh, eight years, there's this technology called uh, manifold plumbing design. Historically, there's this technology that we used to use for years called trunk and branch. So think of a tree and think of branches off the tree. And what happens is the water comes into the tree or house and then goes to different fixtures. Okay? So what we have here is we have water coming into the house and going to different fixtures. Now, if we decide to use the washing machine every day, Every day, this turns over. All this water turns over. Nowadays, we have these manifolds. And manifolds have a, the water comes into the house, goes into the manifold. And if we use this washing machine every day, all the other water in the house stays stagnant. Okay? This is a major change in the water age associated with buildings that is yet to be addressed. I've been in a lot of houses. And I've been in a lot of buildings. And you see all sorts of crazy designs. Uh, you see some really excellent designs associated with plumbing systems. This is a uh, 4,000 square foot uh, mansion in West Virginia on the top of a mountain. Uh, each line here goes to a separate fixture. So if you wanted to, you could stop this right here, cut this off, and that would only take out water service for one fixture in the 4,000 square foot house. The rest of the people would have water. Uh, many people are using plastics when they're doing renovation projects. This is a, a single family home. Uh, they have gas water heaters, they have electric water heaters. Um, and then this is what we're used to seeing, right? So we're used to seeing this. We have, uh, we have shower, shower heads, but we also have these plastic hoses. And there's a study that came out in Germany, or excuse me, in Switzerland recently, showing how much microbial growth happens in this, right? So if you you uh, go away for a week and you leave this, this shower here um, unused and then you come back. You, everybody didn't just leave your house. I mean, you went away. But the organisms that were in that, uh, that water said, hey, party time. Everything's slow. I can grow. Okay? So they grow in that. And then when you come home and if you use that shower, you will be directly exposed to whatever's been hanging out. Okay? <coughs> Commercial plumbing is really complex. When I'm talking about commercial plumbing, I'm talking about hospitals, okay? I'm talking about uh, venues, sports and entertainment venues, um, 
summer communities, casinos, really any places that have these seasonal fluctual, fluctuation in their occupancy. Because, uh, for example, when you go to a hotel, and if the hotel um, says, you know, we just have this new wing, it's never been inhabited before, and you're going to be the first one to go down there, the bell should go off. That means that the water's been sitting in that new wing for probably an undetermined amount of time, and they want you to go down there and be exposed to it. They don't know that that's what they're saying, but that's exactly what they're saying. <coughs> so <coughs> many issues are happening in commercial buildings where disease outbreaks are starting, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you have domestic hot water systems. These are all boilers. This is an apartment building. Um, this is a, a, a kitchen area for a... I think it's a hospital, this is another hospital, uh, and this is a food prep facility. <clears throat> what I want to make clear to you is that the materials that you're installing in your buildings, or your builders installing, or your plumbers installing, are not necessarily what's coming in contact with your drinking water. Because what we have is this, this naive approach to, well, I installed plastic, so therefore I don't have to worry about heavy metals anymore, right? They're gone. Well, we exhume pipe down in Florida. Uh, which is a plastic pipe, and this polyethylene plastic pipe, and we exhumed it, it was completely coated with iron. So iron, a heavy metal, was in contact with the drinking water, not the plastic. Okay? When uh, somebody exhumed a pipe in um, Australia, they found copper coating the inside of a, a plastic pipe. And then here, what was happened in a hospital in Ohio, uh, they had copper pipe, but they also had in-building water treatment. And so they're adding silver to the water to try to facilitate disinfection, except for the fact that, first of all, it wasn't disinfecting, and second of all, all the silver was crashing out and coating the inside of their pipes. Okay? So one of the issues here is understanding what our drinking water is coming into contact with. Because if we don't, which we don't at this time, uh, we have plumbings, pathogens, and disease. Okay? So we have multiple different types of disease-causing organisms called pathogens that uh, take up residency in our plumbing systems. We can't see them, and they grow. And then when we're least expecting it, we'll take a, a glass of water, or we take a shower, and then we come down with pneumonia, or we come down with some type of waterborne disease. And the CDC estimates 80% of uh, the waterborne diseases go undiagnosed, or they're misdiagnosed, where they actually are Legionella or other types of pathogens acquired through the water um, but the, the primary care physicians and other uh, medical community just don't know how to address that. 50% uh, of the waterborne disease outbreaks in the U.S. are due to drinking water. And if you ever travel to hotels and resorts, this is what should pop out at you. So 44% of the incidents between the last 2000 to 2014 occurred at hotels and resorts. So these are some nasty things. <clears throat> You've all heard about Flint, and I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about that. But it is important to understand that there are pathogens that people can be exposed to. And the, one of the takeaway messages that I would like you to know is hospitals and hotels and resorts are likely places where you run the most risk of being exposed to drinking water pathogens. Okay? And um, there have been incidents at university medical centers. Uh, there have been incidents at uh, vet, veterinary administration uh, hospitals. Uh, and there have been incidents in uh, other, other places around the U.S. Um, this incident right here occurred um, in, in Louisiana. And what happened was the drinking water distribution system didn't have enough chlorine in it because their pipes were so bad it was eating up the chlorine. Uh, the, the brain amoeba thrived in the distribution system and then was being distributed to people's homes. And a, a child um, had his slip and slide filled with the tap water, uh, and then that amoeba basically got up into his nose and, and ultimately uh, led to his death. Um, chemicals are an issue too. Copper, lead, zinc, these are issues. And what Flint helped uh, do is, is pull up the curtain on some of the fraud that has been happening associated with drinking water. And the fraud being that statements are being made without regard to the data they need to make those statements. Okay, your water is safe. How do you know that? What data do you have to show that? Well, US water is safe. Well, show me the data is really where we are today. Okay. <clears throat> 
So factors that affect unhealthy drinking water, uh, sediment or solids, the presence of surface area, right? So I use the analogy, we're going to go to Mars, right? Elon Musk said we're going to Mars. So we're going to go to Mars. What do we need to do? We need a place to land and live, okay? Organisms need a place to land and live in our plumbing systems. And if we don't give that to them, they cannot live. Temperature. Temperature is a big issue, right? Mars, a little hot, just a little. So what do we got to do? We have to adapt. We have to adapt for that situation so that we can live and habitate that world. If it's too hot for us and it melts our ship as we enter the atmosphere, then we won't live there, okay? Water age. Water age is basically the expiration date of the water. How old is that water that you're about to drink? <clears throat> water age is great for growing organisms because they need time to grow. And disinfectant residual is basically the disinfectant or chemical that kills them, okay? So if we try to colonize Mars and something comes in and says, no, you're not, and it kills us, we're not going to colonize Mars, okay? So the same concepts that we need to apply to go to Mars are the same concepts for our plumbing systems. We need to keep these uh, organisms away. So water temperature is a big issue, and I just wanted to mention that today uh, because at the end of this talk, I have a list of 10 things that you can do today to help make sure that your plumbing system is healthy and whenever you go out to hotels and resorts to do the same as well for your hotel room. So water temperature, um, a lot of people like to save energy, which is great, and they reduce the water temperature, but you shouldn't really go below 120 degrees. And the reason why you shouldn't go below 120 degrees is because you get closer to the range of Legionella's sweet spot. And Legionella is a pathogenic organism, it's a gram-negative bacteria, that you, you basically acquire through uh, drinking water contact. And it causes what's called Legionella disease, or excuse me, uh, Legionnaire's disease or Pontiac fever. And uh, it is, uh, I think it's, it's pretty fatal. I think I remember seeing statistics about seven out of 10 people that get it, and it's not a diagnosed early, uh, are, it is fatal. Um, it typically affects uh, the young and the very old uh, because their immune systems are compromised, and so that's a big issue. So the US Department of Energy recommends a hot water temperature of about 120 degrees. And, uh, but they say if you have a suppressed immune system, your temperature should be higher. The reason why people say 120 degrees is because you can get scalded, okay? I've got scalded before, right? You ever put your hand under there and you're like, wow, that's really hot, I can't, I can't keep my hand there, okay? Some correctional facilities and mental institutions have limits on how high the water can go. So it's 108 because they're concerned of people either deliberately scalding themselves or undeliberately scalding themselves, okay? So water temperature is really important because you need to kill the organisms and make it inhospitable for them to grow. Now, we, I showed you some examples of disease outbreaks that have happened in the U.S., and that's pretty much just a few of them. I actually uh, had like five slides worth of stuff, and I said, whoa, I can't uh, overwhelm you with all that. Uh, you might get depressed, um, and it would just be an, an awful presentation to give. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, talk a little bit more about why this is happening. So why are these disease outbreaks happening? Well, in 1992, President George Herbert Walker Bush passed and signed a Energy Policy Act. And the Energy Policy Act was to make our country more efficient, more energy independent. And it's a great idea. And so these fixtures, these faucets used to uh, flow four gallons. You could fill four gallons of jug per minute just putting it under there. That's a lot of water, right? And especially if you're heating all that water. So this Energy Policy Act required that we uh, drop down to 2.5 gallons per minute, right? And then due to technological innovations spurred by the Energy Policy Act, manufacturers dropped down the flow rate of faucets to 0.5. And then a colleague of mine called me the other day from industry and he said, did you know there's a 0.01 gallon per minute faucet out there? So that's 400% change. So, so that's a lot. Anybody ever been to a faucet, maybe a hands-free faucet where you put your hands under and it's like dribbling on you? It's not, it's not really pushing anything? Yeah. yeah, all right. Happened to me all the time. It seems like airports love those types of faucets. Um, but that's where we're going. And people are trying to conserve more and more and more water and they're trying to drive down how much water comes out of there. 
when you install a water meter, if somebody installs a water meter for a building, all of a sudden people know how much water they're using and how much expends, and they stop using as much water. Okay, so 31% decline there. Water utilities, or right here, there's other green building uh, efforts underfoot. So the US Green Building Council gives credit if buildings are designed that save at least 20% water. So if you build a building that's 20% less water, then I will give you credit for it. Uh, and you can put our, our logo up there. Um, living building challenges the same way. EPA water sense uh, promotes efficient fixtures and what that means is lower flows. And uh, water utilities that have the infrastructure in place right now, the huge diameter pipes are scratching their heads because people are installing lower flow faucets and, you, and paying money for the, the water that they're using, but the utilities expected more money from them to operate their systems, and they're not. Okay? They're not getting that. So they're having to change how they approach things. The, the economists, the, the CEOs of these companies, as well as the managers of these, these organizations. So my question to you is how old is the water you used this morning and how old is the water that you used the last time you went to a friend's house or a family's house and turned on their faucet? Okay. So if we have an apple, a nice freshly picked apple for, from the store, and, and we know pretty much it's, it's not too that old, but if we have that same apple and we leave it out on the porch for three weeks, we'll know that it's, a, it, it's old, right? Because first of all, there'll be holes in it and maybe the organism's got it. Um, but we can see that and we're like, yeah, we're not going to eat that. Water, you can't do that. You have no idea how old that water is unless you know exactly the, the lengths of your pipes, the diameter of your pipes, the flow rate, the amount of water you used. There has been research showing that water going into certain green office buildings is at least 30 days old before it gets to the fixture. 30 days old. We know from a residential uh, building that we tested Hot water was at least 10 days old before it got to the fixture. Okay. That's a long time. That's a long time. But there is no expiration date. Wouldn't that be interesting? We go to the faucet and there's a sign that pops up that says 10, 10 days old. That'd be cool. Well, I'm not going to use that faucet. I'll be over here. But this one says three. Right? So, so we don't have that power of choice right now with the water that we're using. And with this emergence of plumbing technology, what we're seeing is the rise of risk of disease. So what we definitely have seen in Johns Hopkins Medical Center has firsthand experiences with this is when they renovated buildings in hospital uh, on their campus, they put in these electronic hands-free faucets. And what happened was they did a, a quick test, a, a Legionella presence absence test, and they found that 50% of their samples came back hot with Legionella, a disease-causing organism, for these electronic hands-free faucets, and only 15% came back hot for the legacy old-time faucets. So what do you think they did? Commission the building and move on? So they said this is an unacceptable risk for us. We cannot have Legionella present in our building at this level. So they went in, they ripped out all the electronic faucets, the brand new ones, and they installed the old uh, manual faucets. Okay? And that's what our healthcare industry needs to start doing, is that type of uh, rigorous testing. Uh, here's a picture of a, uh, a polypropylene filter, basically a whole house filter, and this is a bacteria, and there's some bacteria here. And basically, uh, what we found out was that the whole house filter was basically a home for all the bacteria that was being blown into the house uh, through the drinking water system. So change your filters if you have them. Plastics are being installed today, and I can tell you firsthand, without really any understanding about what they're doing to the drinking water. Okay? We know from our own testing that leaching varies tremendously across plastic pipe brands, tremendously meaning that 10 to 20 to 30 times more chemicals are coming out of that plastic pipe than would be normally in the water. Okay. Secondly, um, some of those chemicals that are released by these plastics, organisms are eating the food. That's food for them. That's candy. And so they're able to grow because we're feeding them. Okay. 
We didn't have that problem with copper. We didn't have that problem with ductile iron or cast iron or galvanized iron, okay? But plastics are organic. Uh, pH actually affects plastics, which is remarkable, uh, mainly because uh, the general concept out there is that uh, plastics are inert, okay? That's not true. If anybody says plastics are inert, you need to tell them they don't know what they're talking about because it's not true. And what we found out is that pH actually affects leaching. So your, your neighbor uh, who may be on a well that has a pH water of six and you may be on the municipal system uh, and you, you may have a pH water of uh, nine, you may have the exact same pipe in there and you'll have different leaching coming in your house, okay, from these pipes. <clears throat> metal fittings can, can release um, chemicals and metal fittings are used for these plastics as well as uh, compounds that are causing taste and odors. Uh, people, they don't know what chemicals are, you're actually being exposed to, okay? Because there's really been no research and it's primarily been uh, just because you have an odor doesn't mean it's not safe. Okay. <clears throat> so big misconceptions. The U.S. government does not test plumbing products to determine if they're safe. Okay. They have no regulatory authority. They don't. So <clears throat> who tests them uh, right now is a nonprofit organization paid by industries to get certification to get their product into market. Okay. And there's about 2,100 employees. It's a testing lab, and it's located all over the globe. They have no enforcement capability because they're a nonprofit. They are not a U.S. government agency. And it's important to know, too, the, U the EPA has never given regulatory authority to this nonprofit. Okay? This is a common misconception I hear. Okay? They, they just haven't. <clears throat> um, what happens is they condition the price of 14 days. So here's another issue. When you buy pipe from, say, a supply store and you fix that um, bathroom that you've needed to fix, according to their testing, you need to wait 14 days because they don't care about the water for the first 14 days of use. And then technically, they don't care about the water for another 90 days as well. <clears throat> and so we just completed a study where we were looking at water quality impacts for the first 30 days or 90 days, and we found tremendous variability caused by plastic pipes uh, to that water. Okay, so all that information is not known. Products are not tested for the first 90 days. Uh, and the assumption is it's safe, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and when products are certified to, to be approved for drinking water use by the organization, they don't give out the data. And when you ask them for it, they say no. So there's many science and engineering and architecture and public health individuals working on this issue. Uh, across the U.S. and across the globe. It's a big issue. <clears throat> Some really uh, stand-up individuals. <clears throat> but I'd like to tell you that, it's unfortunate I have to tell you this, but your, your, your health is a greater risk because we have not kept up with plumbing technology. I cannot tell you how old the water is at the tap outside this room. I don't know. I can't tell you how old the water is uh, in a renovated home with all new low flow fixtures but the same old pipes <clears throat> because it's not in the design it's not required and the research isn't out there so as we saw in Flint, Michigan and actually other places around the US people think everything is okay and it's not okay we need to do something about it so here are top 10 ideas <clears throat> for for making sure your water safe first thing you do is you need to go and clean your aerators your aerators are right here Okay, so you go and you can unscrew this and uh, flip it over. You might have some dirt, sediment, or something, but make sure that's out because all the water that flows through that faucet is going to flow by whatever's there. And this came out of my house. So this is lead. Okay, so this was stuck in uh, my aerator. Uh, and so five micrograms is the, uh, well, five is is one number that's out there, uh, 15 is another number that's out there for allowable exposure, okay? <clears throat> um, don't drink water from the shower, and if you're, a, um, if you're a school, don't allow the, the sports teams to fill up their containers from the shower water uh, to take out because those showers are not tested in accordance with um, uh, lead and copper rule standards. Don't drink hot water from a fixture, Heat up the water on the stove uh, and uh, drain and flush out your water heater. Make sure the temperature is at 120 degrees. 
flush unused faucets before use. If your mother-in-law or best friend's coming over, flush it for them, right? Because we want them to get the fresh water, right? That's the right thing to do. <clears throat> Hotels, motels, and hospitals, if you're going to one, as soon as you show up, turn on the water. Let it run. You have no idea who's been in there before. You have no idea what water's been used or if it has or has not used, okay? <clears throat> Determine what types of pipes are in your home. What you want to do is you want to go to your water heater, basically, and look to see what color the pipes are. Go underneath your sink, see what types they are. There's uh, some pipes still in use that are class action lawsuit pipes, ones that are faulty, uh, that should have been replaced uh, be because they, they uh, catastrophically fail without notice. Do you have a lead pipe? If you do, you should probably be using a water filter. And I say that based on the, the incidents that have happened across the US and pretty much the fraud that has been perpetuated by a number of organizations in cheating and gaming the system, okay? So what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to start trusting organizations to treat the water appropriately and to give us the data. And right now what we're seeing is we just can't do that. And when you're told to flush your hot water or your cold water for a certain amount of time by a utility or a municipality after a water main break or boil water notice, ask them why. Ask them where they came up with that number. Because I have evidence that it's random and it's not based on science or engineering, physics or plumbing, okay? And so this happened, uh, I, I got wind of this basically when we responded to the chemical spill in West Virginia. And uh, what happened was uh, the population, 300,000 people, were told to flush their plumbing for, um, <clears throat> for 15 minutes hot water, five minutes cold water, and then appliances for five minutes. But if you look at the size of water heaters, some of them can be 110 gallons. And if you flush for 15 minutes, based on the chemical levels that were in the, the system, the water would not have been safe to drink. Okay? So when people start giving you specific numbers and telling you what to flush for, ask them why. And if you don't trust them, my advice is if you can do the calculation, do it yourself. And if you don't, double it, triple it, quadruple it, okay? Because it's your health, it's your safety that uh, takes priority, all right? So why are you hearing about this now? This is a big issue, right? So there's basically been a historical approach to downplaying public concerns about drinking water safety. And there is uh, many efforts underway at federal agencies to say that drinking water is safe in the U.S. And drinking water is safe in the U.S. as long as you don't go to a faucet where it's not safe. <laughs> I agree. I mean, that's, that's, so there have been a number of statements issued to the public that are just not based on science or refute science or they're, they're, the uncertainty has not been communicated to the public about it. And that needs to stop. And here's an example of another incident where we have cured in place pipe. This is a pipe where you drag this uh, um, resin impregnated sock basically in the hole. You, you cure it because it will fix a broken pipe on the outside and, and you cure it and it cures into this hard uh, material here. And they push steam in but then this white stuff comes out. And the, the current approach to uh, telling the public what to do about this white steam is that it's safe. There's no evidence that it will harm you. But in fact, if you look at the data, they are so bad, their studies are so bad at actually trying to determine what this stuff is that's being emitted that we can tell you for a fact it's just not steam. It's a, it's a bunch of carcinogens. And it's also, uh, we've seen some solid particles as well. So you need to question any information that you're being given. Evidence shows US drinking water may not always be safe in a building. I mean, that's just the fact of it. Um, advice issued from some experts and agencies not actually based on data or science. So you have every right to question it. <clears throat> and the tipping point, I believe, is approaching where people getting sick in buildings, in hospitals, uh, at sports events, in casinos, uh, is going to become more routine unless we do something about it. And we need to act. So thank you very much for spending the time with me this afternoon. I'm happy to talk with you about this. We've got a good 25 minutes uh, for questions, so we should be able to take everybody's questions before we all move to the top of a mountain somewhere. Hi. Uh, are you saying then that the, the new technology with the manifold system is less safe than the old system? 
So that's a great question. So safety would uh, be based on whether or not um, we know for a fact that either chemical levels are too high or organism concentration is too high and people can get hurt. What I'm saying is that the manifold system uh, definitely changes the water age in a building. And I don't know whether or not uh, that change in water age results in unsafe water. But I know there's something happening there and absolutely nobody has looked into it. But generally speaking, aging water inside your pipes tends to make it less safe? Generally speaking, aging water inside your pipes results in conditions that could make it safe. So, so to make it unsafe, you have to prove that it's bad or somebody got hurt. And so that's a, that's a big leap, yeah. Well, how about bottled water? How do we know that's safe? Right, so bottled water uh, certainly is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And I've tested various brands of bottled water, and I tested uh, bottled water uh, that the military was deploying out to uh, California and Afghanistan. Pretty much, uh, the bottled water, as long as it's stored appropriately, it has an expiration date on it. Um, so if the expiration date is accurate and it hasn't undergone any crazy shipping issues, uh, where it sat out on a tarmac, which is what one of the issues they were having in Iraq. They were putting bottled water for three months on the tarmac in Iraq, uh, and it was growing stuff, and, and that was an issue. So when you have those extreme situations, you can have bottled water contamination. But pretty much nowadays, bottled water is safe. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on these water dispensers in the grocery store and hauling it home in these blue jugs uh, and using that for drinking water? Right. So uh, when I was growing up, uh, my mother um, <clears throat> used to go to the grocery store and, and we used to go to some other place and fill up the blue jugs. Um, and, and I always asked her why. And she's like, well, because it was safe. Um, so she, she chose to do that because we had very high chlorine levels and we had extremely high copper levels in our drinking water. And our municipality was saying that it's not their fault, it's our fault, uh, do something about it. So she didn't have any trust in the local utility. Um, it will depend on the maintenance associated with that instrument. So generally, the water systems uh, have reverse osmosis, the ones you're talking about, uh, have other filtration systems, and the, they strip out everything, uh, which, is, which is good, um, but it's maintenance. I've seen some that look like, there's like they're alive, and there's stuff like grown on them, uh, ones that are poorly maintained, and I've seen others that are just look like they're brand new and they're 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I read that the estimate was that half of the pipes in the distribution system for domestic water in the United States were made out of lead. Is that how close is that to truth in your estimate? Um, there, there are hundreds of thousands of lead service lines in the distribution system. Uh, that's a fact. Um, whether or not half the pipes are, uh, I, would, I would say probably not. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands of lead service lines uh, around the U.S. And one of the issues is um, people uh, are claiming, and I think it's right, rip out all the lead service lines. Like, we just shouldn't have them. We know lead's bad. Why are we trying to uh, just deal with it? Why don't we just rip everything out? But I think the, the underlying issue there is that nobody wants to pay for it. So the utility doesn't want to pay for it. The homeowner doesn't think it's their problem that lead was used uh, in the utilities distribution system. And so that's where we are right now. Um, in various places, you, can, you have water companies that are part of a, a governmental <coughs> structure. And, in, and where I've lived in Michigan and Oregon, those places uh, do give you a breakdown of what's in the water. And it's pretty detailed. But here in Indiana, we have Indiana American Water, you know, and they're pri it's a private company. And, and to my knowledge, I've heard it, they, they've said, well, the big thing we got out locally was manganese, but I've never, ever seen a detailed report. If you're a citizen in a town where the water is owned privately, how can you get a detailed report of what's in the water? So, so that's a great question. Uh, from your water company, you can you get the uh, consumer comps report, the one that they, the pretty one that they put together. 
Um, but then if you want the records themselves, you can go to IDEM and demand that they give them to you, and they will. They may tell you to do a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, where you write a letter saying, I want these records. And then they, they have to give you the actual records that the water company submitted to them saying that they're in compliance. <clears throat> the other issue that you brought up about private water companies is playing out right now in West Virginia. So in West Virginia, uh, the, the Chemical Safety Board just released an awful report. Uh, but anyways, they released a report, and in that report, it indicated that there was water testing records that nobody ever was made aware of in the public domain, ever, about the chemicals that were in the drinking water system. And so uh, the Chemical Safety Board, as I said, did an extremely poor job in writing their report. It needs to be retracted. Uh, but in that, it looks like somebody had water testing records that was never released to the public. I talked to the governor specifically, and he said that he didn't know anything about these records. Okay? I talked to the state of West Virginia when they called me in. They didn't know about the records. So who had that data? It, was it the water company or was it buried somewhere else? Because that goes right at your question. You want to have data to figure out if your water's safe. And if we're not being allowed access to that data, that's a big problem. You talked about water age. <coughs> um, I mean, I understand stagnation. And what exactly do you mean by the age of the water? I mean, from the utility company? Or right. So, mean, tarmac water water? so so the water age would be something like, um, <coughs> Think of bottled water. Think of bottled water on a truck and uh, taking three days to get someplace. So that water is now three days old. Think of that bottled water then being put in a storage bin inside the building, sitting there for a week, then moving upstairs and uh, being actually used by the office. So the, the water age would be about 15 days at that point. And that's from treatment. From treatment, right, right. Yeah, so, so instead of bottled water, we just have the water sitting still and then moving down as a slug and then moving down as a slug. Right. Um, so if we're concerned about the quality of our water or if we see it, or if we encounter data or issues with the water, what's something that we could do about it um, if we're on city water or something in order to get the process moving to improve it? So uh, first thing you should do is... Uh, Figure out what you know and what you don't know about the water and what you want to know. And then uh, ask the water company or municipality for their records. Uh, if they won't give it to you, you go to the state. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, start scanning over the records to see exactly what you're being told or not. One of the issues that I didn't talk about is this. Okay, So we can do everything in our power to go get water testing records, to demand that they provide them to us. But if they're making stuff up, we can't do anything about it, okay? So we need as a society to not look at this anymore and say, wow, that stinks, that happened there. We need to say this is completely unacceptable and the penalties for making stuff up and lying should be more severe than imaginable, okay? Because you want to know about your safety and you can't do that if people are lying to you. Okay. Uh, I've learned a great deal about the problems with current piping systems. Um, has there been a development in alternative alternative materials for piping systems? So there, the, the plastics industry would say yes. Uh, there has been a transformational change <coughs> with, with piping, and plastics are, are, can be pretty good materials. Um, the, the way that pipings are installed has been transformational. There's this trenchless technology where you literally don't dig up the street anymore. You just slide the pipe in the ground and then pull it out the other side. So, so that's the innovation that's happened. Uh, the materials themselves really haven't been innovated in years. Um, and uh, that's, I think, primarily because of uh, a tipping point in the market where even plastics are having a hard time breaking in because everybody's used to copper, ductile, cast iron, and, and some other materials. Uh, and also, many of the, uh, the civil engineers and environmental engineers that are running these water systems are trained in concrete, steel, asphalt, timber. And then they had a water treatment course and maybe 20 to 40 years on the job. So plastics, there's an education threshold that we have to educate about how to pick the right plastics, because a lot of people are scared about picking the wrong plastic for their system. So let's say you go away on a trip for uh, three and a half weeks, <coughs> and uh, you're living here in the area in, a, in, in either an older home, if you have an apartment in an older home, 
and you are in a room with its own sink, and the door, and you know, you go away, you lock the door, you don't come back for three and a half weeks. It, how, it <laughs> you know, what do you do? Do you do you let the uh, water run for so you're actually draining the cold and hot water pipes for? I don't even know. How how long do you let them drain? And if you own the house, do you let do you actually drain out the Hot water heater? I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, so as I was preparing this presentation, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm saying things that we have to do based on science, and I don't want to do them because of how much work this is going to take. But I've been telling my family to do it for years, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, so, so what you would need to do, you come home for three weeks, you don't have to, but I would recommend that you drain your plumbing system. So you basically just run the water, you refresh it. Well, um, so typically uh, water, well, it depends on where you are. So if you live on a, a typical city development, your service line will take you about uh, 15 minutes to flush. So if you run the water for 15 minutes, all you did was move clean water into your service line. If you run the water then for the next uh, several minutes, it will, um, should flush the rest of, of, of your taps. Uh, so 30, 40 minutes maybe. But I'm giving you numbers, okay? And, and we just talked about question any number that's given to you because it's not based on science. Uh, my numbers are not based on science. I'm telling you, I'm adding numbers to it and saying just keep flushing, okay? Yeah, I mean, to clean off the filter, you probably don't have to do that every time. Um, but you should do it today, tonight, tomorrow. <laughs> Good thing we came to this. <laughs> sure. So, so I'll tell you, as a researcher putting this presentation together, I got a little angry. And I got a little angry because this is a lot of work. Like, my recommendations, this is, I mean, where is it? Where did they go? That's a lot of work. Like, that's going to take time. Like, I deliberately have to think about this, okay? And why is it that way? And it's that way because people that have developed technology and are, are allowing these products into market and the EPA and CDC haven't thought about all this and they're not doing it, okay? Or they're telling you to do things, but they really don't know how long it's going to take. So. I say this, I, I have compassion for you about what I'm saying, and I'm happy to talk with you or you send me emails and I'll tell you uh, some more advice too if you want it. Sorry. So <coughs> bottom line would be that, let's say that you're getting ready to build your dream house, and what kind of <coughs> system are you going to use, the old fashioned or the manifold system, and what kind of piping materials are you going to run from the water main to, through your house? So we had to replumb a house in Alabama. So when we showed up and bought a house, we hired a home inspector who was incompetent, as it turns out, uh, and he inspected the plumbing system. And he emailed me, I was at a conference, uh, I was up in DC, and he emailed me, he says, everything's fine, you got great pipes. I said, what type of pipes are they? He goes, PVC. I said, send me a picture. And they were gray polybutylene pipes, which is the class action lawsuit pipes that Shell Oil Company sold across the US without ever testing to determine if they would fail. So this is important too from buying a house. So we basically educated the sellers and said, you will drop the price $8,000 and because you cannot sell this house anymore. <clears throat> and they dropped the price $8,000 and we replumbed it and it cost us like 9,000. Um, but anyways, uh, we didn't get the pipes. So what are we gonna do today? Well, when I was looking for, for plumbing pipes, we looked at copper. Copper was gonna cost us 14,000. Um, we were gonna. Uh, we were looking at um, PEX. PEX was gonna cost us uh, three thousand. It's a deal, right? It's just like a vacation. Uh, and then CPVC was gonna cost us about uh, nine thousand. And so I called up the PEX, uh, some of the folks that work in PEX, and I said, "Tell me what leaches out of your product." Uh, EPA has tested uh, CPVC. Cornell tested CPVC, Georgia Tech tested CPVC, University of Texas Austin tested CPVC, but there's nothing about PEX. So I said, tell me what about what leaches out of your product? And they said, Dr. Welton, it is inert. I said, great, thanks so much. Hang up the phone, put the money down for CPVC. <coughs> because I, uh, it, 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 honesty is important to me. And being honest about what your product does and what it doesn't do is very important. Now, 
turn that on. Uh, so I then wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation because I was a little animated. Uh, and we got $330,000 to test the heck out of PEX. And so we've been publishing the data showing what leaches out and what's causing the water and how different the brands are. So, so we've been testing that. So would I install a manifold? No, I wouldn't install a manifold because of the, the water age potential issues. Um, and what pipe would I choose today? It would be, be based on uh, the area. <clears throat> so if there's an area like Southern California where they have pinhole leaks and the copper's five, seven years just going down, I would not install copper. I would install a plastic. Uh, from a resale value, people say that copper is easier to resale. Um, and in Alabama, we didn't have the money for copper because we had put all the money down on our home. So that's my thoughts. I think I have a couple questions. Sure. So I've noticed going to hotels, I spent a lot of time doing that uh, every weekend of my life through college as a student athlete. And the water is disgusting. <laughs> it's, it tastes like I'm drinking water from a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Is that because they're trying to overcompensate with chlorine or other awful things that are in their water? Like, why? So, you spend a lot of time in hotels, you need to start doing some of this. I don't need more. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, th there's two different reasons for like a chlorine taste or odor. One is the presence of free chlorine or bleach, and the other one is the presence of this thing called chloramines, which is like a weak disinfectant that smells like swimming pool. And uh, they have different implications. So the, the presence of bleach is likely a good thing uh, because while it is not palatable, little it's it's highly unlikely that things are growing more than they would if there wasn't any um, <clears throat> the chloramines is a different story and chloramines <clears throat> excuse me are um, very weak disinfectants and actually if you have the wrong conditions in your plumbing system it it degrades the disinfectant turns into pneumonia and then the bugs the organisms love that and they start growing okay so the presence of smelling chlorine uh, could mean there's bleach there, it could mean there's this other stuff there. Um, and what I typically do when I get a big whiff of odor, I go down and start talking to the front desk about what's in their water and this kind of stuff. If they're not using chloramines, they generally won't tell you that they are, they are using chloramines. They, the general front desk will say, oh yeah, that's just bleach. So, yeah. And then my second question is, I, I guess we have, at our, we, I, I rent, uh, my wife and I, and so we have I would assume what is considered a point of use device. It's just a mm -hmm. pure thing on our filter. And we have to use that because, again, our water is kind of gross. Um, and I see the buildup <laughs> in our dishwasher because we don't have a softener. Oh. Um, and so my question is, are there any, I always wonder about the water that we're drinking, even though we use the point of use device, mm -hmm. it's not softened. So I'm sure it doesn't take everything out. Are there any, is there any research on any long-term health effects by drinking extremely hard water or things like that? That's a good question. So there have been studies associated with minerals and impacts on health, and we did some research maybe in 19 or 2005 or something <clears throat> about that. So uh, there have been some studies. There's, there's been uh, heart disease associated with certain mineral levels in water um, <clears throat> long-term. Uh, that work, I think, was done by Johns Hopkins and a university down in South America. Um, so there have been studies about that. Um, I never thought of it until uh, the, wash, the, uh, the dishwasher crept out on us uh, at our rental house here in West Lafayette. And I'm like, what's going on? Uh, and then the, the landlord asked, you know, did you fill up the softener? What softener? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so it was all new to me. Um, but now I'm starting to think about the things you're thinking about since I live here. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, another round of applause for Dr. Weldon. Thanks for your time.